across the country on the environment. Tonight we are being hosted by the Yukon Conservation Society and Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society Yukon chapter. My name is Moira Sauer. I'm very honored to be moderating this evening's discussion. Uh, I would like to acknowledge we are on the traditional territory of the Tan, Quachan, and Kwanlun Dun First Nation tonight for this event. I'm going to start the night off with a couple of rules and regulations. I call it R&R, but it's not at all like the real R&R. &R. Uh, please turn off your phones. If you have a cell phone on you, you can dig in for it now in your pocket or your purse and turn it on to mute or silent or airplane mode or save a battery and turn it right off altogether. Um, I will ask everyone, candidates and audience alike, to please show respect through the night, as I know you will. Candidates, if you could please avoid using acronyms. I know we're in Whitehorse and it's full of them, but uh, be aware of them and maybe define them if you, if you do end up throwing out a lot of acronyms for us. And um, we are also on a very limited amount of time. I'm sure several of you have been to one or two of these in the past and they can they can drag on a little bit. So we're going to do our best to not have that happen, uh, which means we ask everyone to stick to their allotted times. And those are just so everyone's in the clear as to how this evening will run. Each candidate is going to have one minute to introduce themselves. There are five preset questions this evening that uh, the candidates have all had in advance of tonight. They will each have two minutes to respond to those questions. And I will be calling on everyone in a random order uh, to ask, answer each question as it is posed. The second portion of the evening will be uh, questions that you have asked. There was a box outside the door as you came in. You are welcome to throw a question in there. If you still have one that you haven't put in, you are welcome to do so for the next half hour or so. And uh, at that point, the staff will diligently uh, go through and best assemble the questions as they can so we can get to as many of them as we can. Um, audience questions will be selected that best represent environmental issues facing the Yukon and Canada. So not all of them will be asked, but we'll do our best to get to the majority of them as the night goes on. Again, two minutes will be allowed per answer. And um, a, a note on that, the questions need to be posed to all the candidates, not to just an individual candidate, because everyone will have a chance to answer. Clear, clear as, as mud, sort of. Yes? Um, also, I will cut you off. I have control over these microphones, um, but we also have Judith in the front here with time cards, just to keep us all on track a little bit, give you a heads up when you're halfway through and when you've got 15 seconds left. And that red card, when, she, when you see it, we all know. You're done. Um, You'll each get two minutes at the end as well to do a little wrap up and conclusion. And the goal, of course, is for us all to leave well informed, maybe even a little inspired, and to do so by 8.30. Ha! Huh. Okay, opening remarks. This also is entirely at random. So I would invite uh, Joseph Zelesny to please uh, introduce yourself. I knew it. <laughs> um, is, this, is this on? Hello, hello, test, test. Well, anyway, uh, so I'm Joseph Zelesny, and I'm the People's Party candidate for the Yukon. Very exciting times. And I'd just like to begin by pointing out that I'm actually somebody who practices what they preach, and I don't go around uh, making hypocritical comments or suggestions on how people should live their lives. And uh, basically, I've done that with my campaign signs to begin with. I've actually picked up uh, free recycled uh, pallets and I've attached small signs to those to kind of demonstrate that you know I reduce reuse recycle all that fun stuff but I don't go around uh, making giant signs uh, out of either plastic or other other films that that are petroleum based and then uh, actually uh, start with policies that um, attack Canadian uh, energy and natural resource sectors so that's that's that Thank you very much. Oh, now I've got one too. Uh, Lenore Mor Morris, you're next. So thank you everyone for coming this evening. I've lived in the Yukon for most of the last 40 years, but I'm not from here, so I'm a chosen Yukoner. And I chose to live in the Yukon for the same reasons as I chose 11 years ago to join the Green Party, and I chose this year to run for Parliament. And that's because I love the natural world and I want to protect it. 
Green parties were started four decades ago by citizens who saw that the economies of many wealthy countries were unsustainable, that we live on a planet with finite resources and space, and the old, old strategy of permanent growth is not sustainable. There are now over seven billion people living on Earth. We have entered a period of consequences. These consequences include climate change, mass extinctions, plastic pollution of our oceans. The Green Party recognizes that nature has limits. We understand that the economy and our ecology are linked, and a strong economy cannot involve destroying our natural world in the process. Thank you, Lenore. Larry Bagno. Uh, thank you. It's on. Uh, OK, sorry, thank you. Um, many of you know me, I'm Larry, um, but you may not know how long my commitment towards climate change has been. Uh, thir about roughly 13 years ago, uh, our leader at the time, Stefan Dion, started a very courageous climate leader, uh, started the green shift. Um, I fully supported him, but there wasn't this great uh, mass movement there is now. Uh, very few people were supportive of that. Uh, it was very hard going door to door. Uh, you were ridiculed for suggesting we put a price on pollution. Um, at that time, and so I'm so gratified that so many people, so many of you, and many, many more um, appreciate this uh, emergency we're in and that we have to take action. Uh, another thing I did about 10 years ago was uh, promote in Parliament a book called Seasick, where the acid is uh, ru ruining the oceans. And finally, I, something that people are just talking about now, but I proposed a bill that climate change uh, refugees, where their country disappears, um, it becomes ineligible. Uh, source of immigration or refugees. Thank you, Larry. Um, for those of you who are just arriving, there are a lot of seats still available down in front and throughout, and I encourage you to come in and, and grab yourself a seat while we're doing introductions. Um, so next up, we have uh, Justin Lunfers. I acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Kwanlun Dun and Tan Kwachan peoples, and acknowledging that also we are on the land that, they, that we share, not just the land, the water that we share. Because when we're looking forward into the future, when we're looking at the changes that we must make, that we know are coming, we have to consider the impact to the land, to the water, to the environment. That's why we need to act, and we need to act with certainty about what we're going to do. So as a member of the NDP, what my party, what I commit to bring to you, Connors, is our plan. Our new deal for people, which ensures that no one's left behind, and our power to change, which details how we will transition into our new energy economy. We know what we need to do. We know what we have to do to get there. And I, as Member of Parliament, am committed to making the changes that will benefit us all together as people. Thank you so much, Justin. And finally, Jonas Smith. Thank you. My name is Jonas. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I am a lifelong vegetarian. Uh, I became a vegetarian when I was about four years old. But in my 20s, I started hunting and fishing, so the only meat that I eat is what I harvest myself. And so I'm proud to eat organic, free-range, GMO, 100-mile diet meat. I lived off-grid uh, on solar power for 10 years. I hauled water from the creek, I grew my own garden, and I learned a lot of lessons over that uh, decade. You know, I still follow my kids around the house, turning off all the light switches. I use the absolute minimum amount of water necessary to wash the dishes, which drives my wife crazy sometimes. Uh, Speaking of my wife, she owns a holistic health business. She promotes uh, the use of natural products. Uh, the Riding uh, Association of the Conservative Party here in town, the president owns a recycling center. Uh, he's converted uh, plastic bags to heating oil. I've owned not one, not two, but five Subaru station wagons in my life. I like to think that I walk the talk. I am a conservative and I believe in conservation. And I look forward to, to tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. All right, we'll move on to the five prepared questions, the first being about plastics. Plastics are a global environment problem. Worldwide, only 14% of plastics are recycled, while Canada recycles less than 10% of its plastic waste. Over half of the plastics produced are designed to be used once and thrown away. There are inadequate incentives and infrastructure to recover and recycle this material. In the Yukon, our remote nature adds difficulties to feasible recycling opportunities. Additionally, Canada has no regulations that require recycled material to be incorporated into new plastics. The question is, what will you do to advance Canada's efforts to reduce plastic waste and support the North in plastic recycling efforts? 
I will turn, uh, turn it over beginning with Justin Lemfers, please. So what we be plan to bring is both intention and action to the issue of plastics. So let's talk about action first. By 2022, we will ensure that there is a single-use plastic ban in Canada. That is a major part of our platform and commitment to people. For intention, I want to talk about our signs. It was mentioned earlier that we have signs. I had to be convinced as a candidate to invest in signs. I had to be shown that it was foolhardy not to run a campaign without signs. But in order to do that, we did our research. We contacted Yukon Conservation Society and Raven Recycling about how we make the best use in this decision. So what we found out was we put the recycling code on all of our signs. Check out any of our signs. Every single one has the recycling code on it. That's the intention. It's about taking a step further. We also found out that those signs have high reuse potential in insulated buildings. And when we go to the recycling center, they can be treated appropriately. So whatever action that we take, when it's dealing with plastics, when it's dealing with toxins, when it's dealing with the trash in our environment, we are marrying the two together, both intention and action. We are being deliberate in our choices. We are presenting a path for Canadians that gives them the best path forward to a clean environment, an environment that reduces our dependency on plastics, and an environment that allows people to live life to the fullest in the splendor of the nature that we here enjoy in the Yukon. Because I, for one, am tired of doing the Yukon River cleanup, which I don't think happened this year, and pulling out plastics from the wilderness. Thank you so much, Justin. Lenore Morris. So plastics are cheap. Sorry. Plastics are cheap because fossil fuels are cheap, and this has encouraged bad habits and a throwaway society. So we have to change that. The, uh, um, we anticipate that there's a number of different levels that have to be changed, but I'm gonna say that probably everybody that's here is trying to recycle and they're trying to reduce, but it's hard when you go to the store and everything is wrapped in plastic and sometimes it's wrapped in plastic and wrapped in paper and wrapped in another cardboard box. And so some of the some of the aim has to be done at the, the manufacturer and the, and the packaging level. We shouldn't have to go to the store and have to make these difficult choices day after day. Um, a lot of this has to be regulated. Some of it can be incentivized, but some of it actually has to be regulated. If the manufacturers and packagers weren't putting all these products, uh, if they weren't allowed to wrap their products the way they do, we wouldn't be facing these tough choices. The, we also will work with municipalities because a lot of these issues do we have to be dealt with at the municipal level and we will encourage that the um, we need to learn the lessons of nature um, which is to build an economy based on taking discarded materials and feeding them back into production rather than into a landfill one of the difficulties that we have is that there's literally hundreds of different kinds of plastics and they can't be mixed if they're going to be recycled that has to change that there's no reason at all why that hasn't changed long ago that it needs to be standardized so it's actually possible to recycle we want to reduce we want to reuse but last resort resort we want to be able to recycle and that needs to be a made easier. The, um, so minimal packaging for health and safety, reusable packaging. We need to recognize the roles that territories and provinces have for waste management and work in concert with them. We need to work with manufacturers to improve the products. Thank you so much, Lenore. And moving on to Larry Bagno. Um, uh, this is so important that um, like n no one candidate has all the right answers, so I support anything positive to reducing uh, plastics that the other candidates may put forward. We spearheaded the Ocean Plastics uh, Charter at the G7 recently. On November of 2018, the federal, provincial, and territorial ministers agreed to a Canada-wide strategy on zero plastic waste. Um, the things that Moira talked about at the beginning, all the types of actions cost money, and we've committed $100 million to reduce plastic waste in Canada and developing countries. We banned plastic in micro microbeads from cosmetics and other products. Uh, in 2018, we eliminated unnecessary single-use plastics in the federal government, and we put federal government suppliers on notice that we will be working with suppliers who are committed to zero plastic waste vision. We launched the Ocean Plastic Charter at the G7 
which is uh, based on uh, reuse and recycling. And we introduced the first ever zero plastic waste strategy with the provinces and territories. Thank you so much, Larry. And uh, Jonas Smith. I think uh, that our reduction of plastic uh, starts at home in, with individual responsibility. Again, I spent a decade living off grid and that, you know, that taught me a lot about reducing and reusing and reusing and reusing and then finally recycling. And so I think everyone in this room can take real action on their own. I mean, we don't need the government to come and do it for us. That said, if elected, I would be a strong advocate for changing packaging to compostable at the, uh, or at the very minimum uh, using a better grade of plastic. Yeah, I'd like to see uh, a ban of the use of four, five, six, and seven plastics uh, and use uh, only one and two. Um, since the Liberals were elected in 2015, they have been unsuccessful in upholding a number of uh, agreements with international trading partners, and that has affected the price of recycled products. Um, and I think we need stability, uh, particularly where we live, you know, at the ends of the earth, in order for recycling to be viable. Uh, so I would like to see a harmonization of uh, provincial and territorial recycling standards and, and to ensure that we have, we're working from a le level playing field. And I would also commit to working with industry on ways to reduce excessive packaging. Because at the end of the day, we need to help people make better decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. And finally, Joseph, uh, Joseph Zelezny. Yeah, so I, I think plastics are one of the greatest innovations in, in the last couple of decades. Um, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of uh, benefits to being able to um, improve health and safety when it comes to packaging. Also, uh, all these choices people make, it should be up to them. They shouldn't be micromanaged by government policies that ultimately make things more expensive for everybody and result in, in energy poverty. Um, it, so much of it is just empty virtue signaling and the, the real uh, places where, where plastic pollution is the worst, for example, in India or China, uh, there's no outrage there. And, and this kind of hypocrisy, it really needs to stop. It's, it's dividing people. And, it, and every time you try and control and, and tell other people what to do, uh, there's a resentment because not everybody has the same opinions. And there's countless studies that you could point in, in both aspects. So who gets to determine uh, who's, I guess, more superior in terms of determining how other people should live their lives? Um, Canada has a has a problem with trying to um, lecture uh, even on an international scale, and instead of dealing with uh, with waste in a in a proper sustainable manner, uh, there's basically a, a worldwide trade in in garbage and in in plastics, and it doesn't make any sense to be shipping plastics from from the Yukon to Vancouver to be burned there. Instead, I think uh, you could tackle multiple. Uh, issues by having an incinerator with advanced scrubbing technology to ensure uh, uh, not having basically incentives for people to, to throw garbage by the roadside because it's become too expensive to manage their waste uh, in what should already be d dealt with based on, on uh, taxes and, and landfills. Why, why the extra fees for absolutely everything, right? Every step of the way. So, and even just government hypocrisy and and carbon taxes that don't have any, any results other than more corporate welfare. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, moving on to the second question, it is about climate change. If you've just arrived, there are quite a few seats still over on the far side here. I invite you to come and, and grab, grab one. Around the world, we are seeing inspiring examples of leadership to reduce greenhouse gas pollution and accelerate the shift to a cleaner economy. Here in the Yukon, we have seen the community of Old Crow declare a climate change state of emergency. There are extreme weather events across the country, including wildfires, flooding, and droughts. These events are causing anxiety and worry given their enormous financial and environmental impact. Per person, Canadians produce the most greenhouse gas pollution of all G20 industrialized nations, nearly three times the G20 average and over 20 tons per person. In 2016, Canada signed and ratified the Paris Agreement, which committed Canada to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from 2005 levels by 30% by 2030. So far, Canada is falling well behind on this international commitment. The question is, what are the key elements of an action plan that you will advocate for to ensure Canada meets its international obligations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? I'll turn the mic over uh, to Lenore Morris, please.
The Green Party makes this a very high priority, as you might expect. So we have prepared we have prepared a document. It's called Mission Possible, which sets, sets out a number of very specific steps to address climate change. And with respect to the target, I want to point out that the Green Party target is actually twice what the current target is. That's the, the current target is 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and we are suggesting that 60% is a more appropriate number. And the reason why is because we now know that limiting uh, global temperature increase to two degrees Celsius is going to be catastrophic and that we need to limit it to 1.5. We are already at 1.1, so we need to act fast. So uh, among the list of things that are included in Mission Possible, and I'm gonna point out, I heard Elizabeth May talking the other day, she says it's Mission Possible, it's not Mission Easy. It's not going to be easy to do all of these things, but it's definitely possible if we work together. So establish our new target and file it as Canada's nationally determined contribution with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So again, 60% reduction over 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, Declare a climate emergency is included. I'm gonna point out the federal government's already declared a climate emergency and most of you know they declared it one day and the next day they approved the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. So that's how seriously they took it. Uh, establish an inner, inner cabinet of all parties. We think all of the parties have to work together. This is an actual emergency and we need to work together. Uh, there's no room for partisanship here. Assume leadership, so attend the next climate negotiations in Chile this year and press other countries to also double their efforts. Respect the evidence, that's the most important thing. We have overwhelming scientific evidence here. We need to respect it, we need to follow it. Ban fracking, green the grid, more renewable energy, that's what we need in Canada. Modernize the grid. Thank you, Lenore. And we'll turn the mic over to Jonas Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, so on the, the local scale, I think the single most effective step we as Yukoners can make is encourage additional hydro capacity. Uh, you know, I support biomass, geothermal, solar and wind, but water always flows downhill. I think hydro is, is the ticket. And I think there's a big opportunity to work with uh, Yukon First Nations. Um, you know, particularly on smaller sites. I don't think we'll ever see a large hydro site ever built in the Yukon again. But with a small site, you have a more manageable environmental footprint. You have opportunities for First Nations to be partners and invest and, and prosper financially from the green energy production. Um, so in addition to supporting uh, domestic energy production, you know, I also support domestic food, domestic products, anything that reduces uh, emissions from transportation of all the essential goods and services that uh, we've uh, grown to rely on in our, our modern lifestyles. Um, but again, I'll come back to, you know, having lived off grid for a good chunk of my life, I, I don't believe we need our government forcing us uh, to do certain things. I mean, there's, there's personal choices that we can make. I don't expect everyone to make as extreme choices as I've made in my life. But I think the government should incentivize us as, as opposed to punishing us with taxes. So I, I'd like to see a government that educates and uh, uh, encourages and, and makes these choices easier. Uh, so I support tax cuts and credits, you know, for, for home retrofits that make your house more green. Um, one of the things we've committed to is removing GST from home heating. It's not a luxury to heat your home in Canada for 10 months of the year. And that leaves more of your own money in your own pocket to invest in better choices. I mean, sometimes we're limited in making those better choices because we can't afford them. Now on the global scale, one of the things I'm happy about with the Conservative Party platform is uh, exporting Canadian technology abroad because we live in a wealthy country where we can export our technology to places where they don't have the opportunities and therefore Canada has an opportunity to reduce global emissions and really make an impact. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Moving on to Justin Lemfers. In order to address climate change and greenhouse gases, the NDP has a plan. It's our power to change plan. And so a principal part of that plan is on day one of forming government, we end fossil fuel subsidies. So that means that the companies that are getting corporate rebates, corporate cuts, incentives from the federal government cease to have those. Instead, we take that money, we take the investment that's going to those companies and we flip it into green energy, clean energy technology, wind, solar, hydro, and any other emergent technology. We 
go forward with that investment and we look towards 2030. And in 2030, we will have a net zero carbon energy footprint. So any ounce of carbon is offset by our clean energy. We also will have electrified public transit by that point in time. And that's not just transit within our communities and municipalities, that's transit that connects our communities. From there, going all forward into 2050, that we have a net zero carbon reduction future, so that we're 100% carbon free for our energy production. That we have invested in the homes that we live in to ensure that the energy footprint of our homes is reduced because we have retrofit our building stock. Our plan takes us there. We also need to make sure along the way that this is all affordable because any incentive program that we have has to have an entry point for people that are at the bottom end of the poverty scale. That means that we have to bring people out of poverty because our plan relies on us not leaving anyone behind. The only way to build an energy future that works for people is to bring people with it. That's what climate justice in our energy future looks like. Thank you, Justin. And we'll pass the mic over to Joseph Selesny. So uh, we're carbon-based life forms and carbon dioxide is, is essential for all life on Earth. Having zero carbon dioxide would result in zero life on Earth. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, whistleblowers that have come forward discussing uh, how there's been fraudulent data in these climate models, how there's been uh, data that was created to fit in where there were no temperature stations uh, around the world. Uh, and there's also been some very uh, selective um, use of, of data records that were only looking at uh, shorter timelines. On a long enough timeline, our carbon dioxide levels are actually uh, rather low. And uh, the, the whole climate, there's, there's a lot of uh, censorship happening about uh, what truly drives our climate. And it would be foolish to think that only carbon dioxide is, is driving the climate. Um, I don't know about you, but when I go outside and it's a sunny day, I feel the warmth from the sun. And uh, there's countless books and, and research studies demonstrating how the sun is critical for uh, for managing uh, the climate on the Earth. Same thing with uh, electromagnetic fields, as well as jet streams, volcanoes, all these sorts of things. And so those are things that we absolutely can't control. And uh, this fear-mongering is, is not doing anybody any service. The rest of the world's laughing at us because basically this, this whole Paris Accord is a socialist wealth redistribution scheme to make e everybody equally poor. And uh, there's no other institution but the UN that is is so corrupt. I mean, we've had these uh, end of the world predictions for for decades, and it's always been, uh, you know, mini ice age, global warming, um, acid rain. Like we're still here, everything's fine, and what we need to do is get rid of all corporate welfare, including uh, oil and gas, uh, to have a level playing field and stop trying to micromanage everybody's life. Because the only way that you could do this is to control the economy totally. Thank you, Joseph. And finally, Larry Bagno. Um, thank you. I'd love to respond, but uh, this, this is so serious. We need so many actions. I'm going to talk really quick to try and get many in. We're going to continue with the uh, huge renewable projects we're doing, like the solar panels in Old Crow, the three windmills in Kiwani, the biofuel in Teslin, the 41 million, the largest retrofitting of buildings ever in the Yukon. Uh, their electric car subsidy of $5,000 a car, the electric fast charging stations I've announced, the 20 million storage battery for the Whitehorse Dam, probably perhaps the biggest in the country, uh, the city buses, the city bus stop, and the buildings so the buses don't have to run all night at 30 below, the uh, over a thousand transit projects in the country, we can talk about that later, the clean fuel standard will take 7 million cars off the road, methane regs that are reducing greenhouse gases by uh, methane by 40%, and the 400 Yukon homes that we are putting smart devices in, on new things on top of that, a $5 billion clean power fund. That's a huge amount of money. So we have the cleanest mills, mines, and factories in the country. That will also be used to take more northern communities off diesel, like the ones I just mentioned. Uh, federal grants to have buses and trains. Uh, well, we won't give them grants unless there are zero emissions after 2023. We're going to have 5,000 charging stations so people can drive across the country. Uh, 
we're going to have the business fleet work to get conversion of business fleets, taxis, mining trucks, couriers, cut corporate taxes by 50% on companies producing greenhouse technologies like windmills, solar batteries, electric vehicles. A net, um, we plant $2 billion trees to sequester carbon, help retrofit $1.5 uh, million dollar homes after giving them a free energy audit. And so people can afford it, even low income, there's going to be a $40,000 interest-free loan to do that retrofitting. 5,000 grant for new zero emission homes, a $400 uh, million long-term funds for private capital to retrofit office towers and make Energy Star certification for your appliances mandatory by 2022. I'm very excited and committed to this exciting list. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Moving on to question number three, it's about pollution and toxic substances. Canada's laws and regulations have not kept pace with emerging threats from newer toxic substances in our environment, including from pesticides in our food and other harmful chemicals in everyday consumer products. Many of these substances have demonstrated links to cancer, genetic damage, development problems, chronic illness, and many other health effects. These effects are often more severe for children and other vulnerable populations. Our overarching toxics law, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act has not been significantly strengthened in 20 years. The question is, what will you do to ensure that Canadians are better protected from the health and environmental impacts of toxic substances? Will you commit to strengthening the Canadian Environmental Protection Act? And we will start this one off with Larry Bagnall. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, for a number of years now, I've talked to my colleagues at the things in the air, pollution in the air and the chemicals. Um, there should be a study uh, on all those things that cause cancer and action uh, taken for them. Uh, so this is a great question. We've committed to eliminating coal by 2030, and coal has, uh, one of the things that will reduce or eliminate is uh, mercury emissions, and that's one of the most toxic substances. Our plan to ban uh, microplastics uh, means less microplastics in our environment and in our bodies and our food sources. Uh, we've banned asbestos. Once again, I lobbied my colleagues in my own party for a number of years before we did this that we need to ban asbestos, and I'm very excited we've done that. And we have, and I'm, for all these reasons and for what Moira just said, I'm very excited that we've committed to introducing a bill to reform the Canada Environmental Protection Act as soon as possible. Thank you, Larry. Moving on to Justin Lemfers. Yes, we will absolutely strengthen the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And this, this is why believing science is necessary. Because when we don't believe science, when we doubt what people are telling us in communities, we end up with situations like Grassy Narrows, where a community has been poisoned by mercury, where people are living, where people are dying in conditions that are unfit for human life because science is not being believed, because people are not being believed, and because government is not acting. So we believe in making changes that will benefit people. And specifically with asbestos, once it was recognized that asbestos was so harmful to people, our government continued to export it. No, that's not good enough. So not only do we have to strengthen our Canadian Environmental Protection Act, we have to make sure that we treat our people all around the world with the same quality, the same protections that we want for ourselves. We have to treat our international trading partners with respect. We have to treat the people within our First Nation communities with respect. So we will get there by enshrining into legislation for ourselves an environmental bill of rights, guaranteeing every person access to clean air, water, and land without the encumbrance of poisons and toxins. Looking beyond that, let's talk for a moment about fracking, about what happens when we poison our water tables, when we disrupt the ground beneath our feet. There may be energy in fracking, but it's not worth the cost. It's not worth the cost of damaging the environment and destabilizing the world around us. So we are willing to take those measures. We are willing to take those bold actions and protect what people need to be kept safe. Thank you, Justin. Joseph Zelezny, you're up. So this is something I'm wholeheartedly in favor of. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, unfortunately not getting enough attention because uh, all the global warming uh, fear-mongering is. It's also getting all the money. 
and where Canada is, is sending billions of dollars around the world without taking, uh, taking care of, of, uh, of tangible things at home. Um, after almost 100 years of uh, conservative and liberal governments, there's become uh, institutionalized corruption and we still have uh, many places around the country where there's toxic drinking water and uh, plenty of examples, whether it's in Quebec or, or uh, British Columbia, where there's raw sewage being dumped into the waterways. And then, you know, everybody blames climate change for depleting fish stocks, but is anybody looking at, uh, at uh, what, uh, what the effects of uh, dumping raw sewage are into into the waterways, and uh, it's it's pretty obvious what the effects of that are, and so we need to take a practical approach and deal with problems at home first before trying to uh, tell other people in other countries how how to live their lives, and so um, the federal government is responsible for ensuring appropriate hazardous uh, recyclable material and waste management, and that's something that I would uh, definitely uh, work. Uh, towards ensuring that the laws that we do have in place are actually maintained and, and sorry and used because uh, as a lot of people have probably noticed there's been uh, more and more and more corruption uh, in in government where uh, governments choosing winners and losers based on lobbying and in fact uh, not applying uh, laws equally to to those who, who violate them as well as not creating enough incentive for companies to do uh, good as opposed to, uh, it's in many cases cheaper to uh, pay a fine than it is to comply. So if you just readjust the fines where it's cheaper for companies to comply with environmental regulations that make sense, then uh, they'll do so. Thank you, Joseph. Jonas Smith, you're up next. Again, I'm going to come back to uh, personal responsibility and initiative. I mentioned in my preamble that uh, my wife has a business that promotes natural products. So she's replaced all the cleaning products in our house with uh, homemade, natural, non-toxic, environmentally safe products. So th these these options exist today. I mean, you can take action today and, you know, as Gandhi said, be the change you want to be in the world. Uh, that said, uh, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, uh, the language is, it aims to present pollution and protect the environment and human health with the goal to contribute to sustainable development development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So I, I support that language and additionally part of the act is there's a mandated five-year review. So I would support at that time reviewing things in particular what I would like to uh, focus on are um, the, the loopholes that exist right now. For uh, right now uh, you can get away with not listing certain substances many of which are toxic uh, under the term of fragrance for example. And there are things under that topic that are quite harmful and in some cases even carcinogenic. So I would be very supportive of amendments at that level. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. And finally, Lenore Morris. Can you Sorry, oh, I go. am going to read from the party policy because, in fact, it starts, uh, one of the sections starts with strengthening the Canadian Environmental Pre Protection Act to limit the approval and use of toxic chemicals that affect our health and our environment. There is lots that can be done. Uh, somebody else, somebody mentioned that we need to follow the science, and we absolutely do need to follow science. We also need to do the science. Huge numbers of chemicals are being used in our products every day, including foods that we eat that have never been approved. Period, because the that's there, it's not required for them to be to be approved. The, so we need to be doing a lot more science so, so that we know, in fact, what it is that we're putting into our bodies and that we're, what we're exposing ourselves to. So uh, the Green Party uh, advocates passing legislation to give Canadians the right to a healthy environment, promoting greater transparency in decision-making, decision public participation rights, and access to judicial review mechanisms. So set targets for reducing the use of pesticides in agriculture. That's less of an issue here than it is some places. It's a huge water pollution issue a lot of places. The uh, strengthen the, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act to limit the approval and use of toxic chemicals that affect our health and environment. Regulate microfibers as a toxic substance. That's a huge issue in Canada. It's an increasing issue. Um, the microfibers are getting into literally everything, including into our bodies and into our food supply. We would invoke the precautionary principle when it comes to making decisions, revive and expand the National Pesticides Monitoring and Surveillance ne Network, create an adverse 
effects reporting database for doctors because sometimes there are ill effects that people are suffering and nobody knows about it. Well, one doctor knows about it and another doctor or and another nurse knows about it and these individuals know about it. We need to, we need to be gathering the science. Uh, ban all toxic ingredients in personal care products. We're here in the Yukon. We have a pretty good environment right now, but it could be better. Thank you, Lenore. Can I just say, I'm loving how on time you guys are. I'm so impressed right now. I'm so impressed. Gold stars all around. Uh, question number four is about wilderness con conservation. When asked about what they love most about our country, Canadians often point to natural beauty, wildlife, and spectacular wild spaces. Yet we are falling below our international commitments to protect these spaces. A recent study shows that 50% of Canadian wildlife species are in decline. 87% of Canadians value the emotional and physical benefits of spending time in nature. However, 82% say that they're concerned that future generations won't have close or easy access to nature. The question is, what will you do to protect the quality and quantity of wilderness in the Yukon and Canada so there is a better legacy for future generations? And we'll start this question off with Jonas Smith. All right, thank you. I mean, Yukon's wilderness is why we live here. It's, it's what makes the Yukon so special. Uh, but we have an abundance of wilderness, and we have a deficit of infrastructure, which requires development. So, you know, if we're talking about uh, additional protections on wilderness, I think the question we need to ask is, what are we willing to give up? You know, uh, I think we need to be careful on what kind of limits we place on development. Do, do we want to put limits on developing tourism? Uh, you know, where do cell phones come from? Where do the, where do the products that uh, pacemakers come from? You know, I support, I support domestic production. Um, I believe that developing materials here at home responsibly is better than the alternative, uh, which is, you know, having other countries develop them in environmentally irresponsible and unethical means. Um, but, you know, part of having this great wilderness here means we have to travel a lot bet uh, bet between our communities and to visit the wilderness. So that means driving. You know, where does oil and gas come from? Uh, you know, we all want to leave a better world for our children, uh, but that does come uh, with, with balance between uh, environment and economy. Uh, the reality is we have only 40,000 people living in an area the size of Spain. Uh, so the, just the very nature of where we live, much of Yukon's wilderness will continue to protect itself. Uh, but what I will say, uh, under the party platform, uh, the Conservative Party would restore funding to the National Wetland Conservation Fund. It would also restore funding to the Recreational Fisheries Conservation Partnership Program, and would also reconvene the Hunting and Angling Adva Advisory Panel. All three of these things uh, the current Liberal go government has cancelled and defunded. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. And Justin Lemfers, you're next. When I think about wilderness in the Yukon, I think about salmon, I think about, s about caribou, I think about pollinator species, I think about water water that is sacred that connects us all and connects us all to the wilderness and the way that we look after our wilderness is that we increase the protections under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act we're very fortunate here in Yukon to be leading in wilderness protection and it's not wilderness or development we have both it's wilderness and development what we need to ensure is that the development is responsible so we need to ensure that the wilderness is protected through what we plan to do with the strengthening of the act and also that when people contravene the act that there's real teeth to it that there's penalties for polluters there's penalties for when development does not go according to plan so when you have an example when we we have an example of one of the world-class things not to do with a mine site which is called pharaoh that the company, that the people that are responsible for that action are held to account. And that's what we want to see. That's what we will change in law. That's what we will enshrine into legislation. Real protections for people so that the wilderness can stay sacred. Beyond that, we need to look at how we keep it sacred with our partners, our indigenous communities, our First Nations here in the Yukon. So we commit to expanding the Indigenous Guardians program. We commit to making sure that 
First Nation people have access to training. And not just First Nation people, all people have access to training to better protect the wilderness. So if people want to quit their job to go back to school, we will allow for an EI supplement for that. That's part of our plan, because we want people to be in a place where they can help the wilderness to be what it needs to be for all Yukon people. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Lenore Morris, we're going to move to you next. So I also live in the Yukon because of the natural environment here. But I would say that nationally, and even more so globally, that wilderness is a rare thing and it's getting more rare. We live in a tiny territory with, uh, it's a large landmass with a tiny population, but globally we have a very, very large population, over seven billion people. What we have here is something, it's extremely precious. I think that for many people, it's not valued as much as it should, the wilderness, People come from all over the world to the Yukon to enjoy our, our wilderness, but I think that there's some people in the Yukon that don't value it as much as it should be. And if they were living in places that were a lot more crowded, maybe they would appreciate just how rare and special it is. Our prosperity does not have to involve environmental destruction. Uh, Yukoners, Canadians can do more things than dig oil out of the ground if they're in Alberta or dig minerals out of the ground if they're in Yukon, cut down trees. There's lots and lots of things that we can do for prosperity. We have an arrangement in place. We have legislation in place to deal with land use management, and I have total respect for that. The Green Party doesn't want to put our land into a museum, but we do want to respect the value of it, which we say is very, very high. For the Green Party, uh, our target would be con nationally to protect a minimum of 30% of freshwater, ocean, and land by 2030. We are at a point where we can still do that. In a few years, we'll not be able to do that at all. We need to take advantage of these opportunities while, while we can. Uh, we would commit $100 million annually for the next four years to create indigenous-led, protected, and conserved areas and fund stewardship of these lands and waters by indigenous guardians. We, uh, we agree, these the indigenous people are our natural partners and we need to work with them. Thank you, Lenore. Larry Bagnell, it's your turn. Uh, thank you because I'm so passionate about the parks is a, a very important function of government. I'm excited about this uh, question. I'm very glad it's here. So when we uh, got elected, there was less than 1% of our oceans in Canada were uh, protect, uh, protected. And now we have uh, our, our target for 2020 was to move that up to 10%, uh, a big target, but we've already uh, moved it up to 14%. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, in uh, also our uh, terrestrial target, uh, for 2020 is 17. Uh, we're not there yet, but we've moved it up uh, from 10.5% to 12.6%. And we have massive new efforts through a huge uh, 1.35 billion a nature fund to help protect and uh, maintain our parks. And I, I think I remember a great exciting uh, email from CPAWS the day we announced that. Um, our platform for 20. Uh, 2025 is to move both those areas, uh, w fresh water and oceans, up to 25%, and by 2030, uh, up to 30%. Um, yeah, we're ex we too are excited. We uh, started the Indigenous Guardians program in 2018. It's been very successful. We launched it in Arctic Bay, and we will continue that. Some of the big parks um, that uh, we've announced are working on is Telluric Tupat Imanga. It's 109,000 square kilometers. It's Canada's largest protected area ever. Another is Tuval Juetuk. It means, uh, in an architect, it means the ice never melts. It's bigger than Newfoundland and Labrador. There's Driftwood Code, there's Ru uh, Rouge Park expansion, South K Okanagan, and so Makamin, with uh, that one developed with uh, the Salix and the Okanagan First Nation. So this is very exciting and I'm really passionate that we're making all these improvements and increases to our parks. Thank you, Larry. And finally, Joseph Zelezny. So we need to be careful with, uh, with how far uh, things go. Um, Canada used to be uh, very resource rich and uh, even economically, uh, people came here for, for freedom and for prosperity. And what's been happening over, over several decades is there have been uh, foreign funded groups that have been acting on 
uh, others' behalf to, to lock up our resources and to uh, create more dependence and uh, almost uh, to, to prevent people from actually being able to, to develop and produce things and uh, instead to import more from around the world. Uh, Bill C-69 and C-48 are uh, discriminating only against uh, Canadian businesses. I in, in the meantime, we're actually importing 60% more oil from uh, Saudi Arabia and also now on the East Coast from Russia because we don't have domestic pipelines. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of people that have lost their jobs and uh, I've talked to countless people who are now working two or three part-time jobs for minimum wage instead of having a, you know, a, a really good job, either being an environmental consultant or project manager or a welder. And so these things need uh, a much more practical approach and not to have this hypocrisy which uh, favors, um, for example, importing cheaper products from China, which has uh, slim to none uh, environmental standards and uh, at the same time taking livelihoods away from uh, fishermen, for example, or, or tr uh, loggers uh, in northern BC. I mean, uh, w where where's the money for all these social programs going to come from? All the other parties are promising more and more money constantly, and yet we've got a massive debt. We've got growing unemployment. Uh, the, the numbers don't ref the unemployment numbers don't reflect uh, the reality that uh, I've, I've discussed with, uh, with countless Yukoners. And um, I think there's plenty that's protected and it's time to actually put Canadians to work and and um, and allow for innovation and prosperity and so final question is about water many Canadians know that our country has the longest coastline in the world less well known is that Canada is home to roughly half of the world's lakes and roughly 10 percent of the world's wetlands Canada is also home to seven percent of the world's fresh water Lakes, rivers, and wetlands form critical habitat for wildlife of all shapes and sizes. Most of Yukon's electricity is hydroelectric, and we all know that salmon migrate and spawn in our rivers. The question is, what will you do to work with different sectors like First Nation governments, industry, and the Yukon public to keep our water and supporting ecosystems free from pollution and degradation? We'll start this off with Justin Limfers. I have a very clear memory of canoeing down the Tikini River, about coming around a bend in the river where the water went from green to red because there were so many salmon. That was almost 30 years ago. And these days, I'm lucky if I see a single salmon. So something's not working. And that's what we're doing to our environment, how we're treating the water, and also how we're relating to our partners, our partners here within the Yukon, when we're not empowering them to look after the resources, that means respecting the treaty agreements with First Nations, respecting the final agreements, but also how we're working with our international partners, how we're not being heard, not making ourselves heard on the international stage to protect our water and everything that lives in that water. That's why the Environmental Bill of Rights is so essential and why it's such a core part of our platform. That's why the changes to the Canada Environmental Protection Act are central. That's why we want to implement a national freshwater strategy. We want to restore the navigable waters protections for all lakes and rivers because that's what needs to be done. So the NDP commit to doing that. It also means that when we think about development, we think about water's role in it. So it's actually not, outsourcing development isn't socially or, or globally responsible. It's pushing that burden onto countries that don't have per environmental protections into place, that don't have a carbon plan in place to manage that extraction economy. So we need to own the development within Canada. We need to ensure that our water is protected and we need to take that onto ourselves. And that's what the NDP plans to do. We have that plan to do it all through our power to change and our new deal for people. And as member of parliament, that's what I commit to do. I commit to working with our First Nation partners, to working with our international partners, and to helping Canada meet its necessary obligations. Thank you, Justin. Larry Bagnall, we'll hand the mic to you next. Uh, thank you. One of the uh, uh, most damaging uh, things to our water is uh, uh, sewer and uh, water and wastewater projects. So we have, as you know, the biggest infrastructure uh, fund in Canadian history, and we've approved over 500 
uh, water and wastewater projects already uh, on over and it affects over 500 First Nations and 450,000 Canadians who have cleaner water. One of the things we inherited, and I know everyone here is very sensitive to this, that this shouldn't be happening, was over 140 uh, boiled wa long-term boiled water advisories in Canada on remote uh, villages. And we've eliminated 80 of those already, uh, and there's 50 left which will be eliminated. These are very highly technical uh, projects, so 50 left will be eliminated in the next two years. As I said, we, um, we've uh, banned uh, micro uh, beads in cosmetics and toiletries. Uh, which was getting into our water, into our bodies, etc. Uh, the Navigable Waters Act was uh, emasculated by a previous government and we've reinstated uh, protections under that. Uh, and the Ocean Protection Plan of $1.5 billion, the biggest such plan in Canadian history. Uh, and some of the items under that are the marine ecosystems and natural habitat of species. That's just one of the four uh, objectives of that plan. Um, also, of course, the Nature Fund to protect our parks and the water in those parks of the $1.35 billion that I mentioned earlier. And finally is uh, the integrity of our environmental uh, uh, assessment process in the Yukon. It's unique in the country. It's a model for the country. But as you remember, the last government uh, tried to uh, um, change that without uh, Yukoners, Indigenous people, as was in their uh, constitutional right through their land claim and uh, environmentalists Yukon didn't have a say there wasn't the proper consultation and so we um, as soon as we promised uh, that we would change that back and we did change it back when we got in government thank you Larry Lenore Morris Lenore doesn't like her <laughs> microphone <laughs> I just want to mention that the question is about working with the uh, different sectors. So absolutely, for, for the Green Party, as I mentioned, the environment obviously is a huge priority f for, that, for us. And that means, yes, the water and supporting ecosystems. We see First Nations governments as natural partners with us. Uh, we see industry as having a huge role in it. We don't have a lot of industry in here in the Yukon other than the mining sector. And uh, I'm, I do have to point out that the regulation of that is a territorial jurisdiction, but the, the federal government does play a role, with res particularly with respect to water under the Fisheries Act, and we'd like to see proper enforcement of the Fisheries Act, and that includes that there being adequate staffing so that you can have all the rules and regulations that you want, but if you haven't got any enforcement of it, they're, uh, they're ba basically useless. Um, it means working with municipalities as well, and in, in some cases working with foreign governments. So when we're talking about, obviously, the caribou is a huge issue uh, that spend part of the year, year in the United States and Alaska. Um, we need to work better, more effectively with the United States government and the Alaska government with respect to that. The um, one of the big things that the federal government does do is they spend money. So they might not have regulatory control over everything that goes on here in the Yukon, but they have a great deal of money to spend. And so I would suggest that we simply direct the funding that we have to improving the environment that we have. I'm going to say less money perhaps on building road to resources and more money on environmental protection. The um, with respect to hydro, which everybody admits that we need, absolutely, we could have more hydro without building dams, without uh, destroying our waterways by using run of river technology, which is already used a lot in BC. Thank you, Lenore. <laughs> Joseph Zelezny. So absolutely, the People's Party of Canada respects all uh, First Nations self-governments and treaties. Um, at the same time, uh, we need to uh, fix the, the broken uh, permitting process. Uh, there's countless uh, businesses that are absolutely frustrated with uh, with how the system is broken, how there's an in, in insufficient amount of resources available. Um, there's not even habitat studies being done for, for salmon. Uh, there's no bilateral uh, discussions with, uh, with, for example, uh, Russia or other Arctic nations to determine where, where these uh, salmon are going. We don't have adequate uh, coast, guard coast Guard resources to see uh, if there's other countries that are fishing in our waters. 
Um, so basically, there's, there's so many things that are being mentioned and kind of talked about and always some consulting and all that sort of stuff, but there's no uh, kind of boots on the ground and things being done. And so we need, to, we need to fix that. We need to stop worrying about the rest of the world and focus on, on Canada. Um, uh, in addition, uh, you know, even considering uh, natural factors, like uh, there was a landslide in, in BC, uh, I think a month or two ago, where it actually blocked the, the path for, for salmon going up the river. And so uh, we need to consider all, all these different uh, elements. In addition, some, uh, some environmental standards don't make any sense whatsoever, and they're heavily uh, paperwork and bureaucratic driven. In, in some cases, um, if water is being processed, uh, it needs to come out at a lower, for example, parts per million amount of, of copper or, or some other element um, than is naturally occurring. And so some of these burdens are really um, turning away businesses and uh, reducing uh, economic opportunity because there's just too much bureaucracy and the cost of living is too high, carbon taxes, and, and this just goes on and on. And so if we don't change that now, we're, there won't be an economy and uh, these promises won't be able to be funded. Thank you, Joseph. And uh, finally, Jonas Smith. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, clarify some language in your preamble. Uh, you referred to First Nations as sectors, and uh, First Nations are governments. Their final agreements are constitutionally entrenched. And uh, that goes for uh, uh, the non-settled First Nations in Yukon as well. I think they are governments as well, and they need, need to be treated as such. Um, I'm a fisherman. As I said, that's, that's what I eat. That's what I put on my table. That's what I feed my family. I want to be able to teach my children to fish in the same lakes that I learned to fish in. Um, so v water is essential to us. I want my children to be able to drink it. Um, but as many of you know, my day job I is advocating for the mining industry. And we hear about uh, the failures in the newspaper, but we don't hear about the vast majority of successes in water management in the Yukon. I mean, the, the, the every drop of water in the Yukon is the the legal purview of the Yukon Water Board. Um, but that said, uh, I think there is uh, opportunity for the federal, federal government to do more. Uh, as Mr. Bagnell mentioned, uh, some changes were rolled back uh, in our environmental assessment uh, legislation uh, under his government. Uh, but those changes were only supported uh, based on developing a collaborative framework to address the outstanding issues and nothing has happened on that front over the last four years. So I think it's essential that we uh, improve the ESSA process. Uh, you know, again, I work in the industry. I deal with assessors, with regulators, uh, proponents with First Nations. Everyone who's involved in it agrees that the legislation is broken. So we need to fix that in order to have some certainty to know what kind of activities are permittable and what kind of oversight there is. Um, I also believe in partnership beyond government. I, I would point to the uh, relationship between Victoria Gold and the Natronaic Dunn and all the benefits that has brought to the community because at the end of the day, uh, saving our water is a responsibility of all Yukoners. And in closing, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jonas. I love a man who follows the rules. Um, all right, so that, uh, that wraps up the first portion of this evening. Thank you all for your thoughtful answers. Um, we're going to move on to audience questions now. Um, if, if everyone's comfortable and good to continue, we'll just hammer on through this evening. Um, we are not going to be able to get to all the questions asked by you, um, but the staff has gone through everything and they are handpicking as, as widely as possible uh, questions that are either asked by a few people or can be combined a little bit. So we'll start with this one. And again, uh, the answers will be two minutes in length and I have uh, the, re the names randomly selected for the order. At this critical time in the life of our planet and all living species dependent on it for survival, what makes you qualify to lead us through the next 10 years that will determine the future of our planet? And we will start that off with Lenore Morris, please. What makes me qualified? I would, first I, I'm someone who's lived in the Yukon for a long time. I've lived here the majority of the last 40 years, uh, but, I'm not, but I'm not from here. And I think that honestly that 
the fact that I've lived other places and I'm from someplace else makes me value the Yukon more even than if I came here necessarily. Uh, I have a good education. I have, including a degree in business and a degree in law, I have worked for the government. I worked for the Yukon government for four years, so I do have an idea of how Yukon, the Yukon governments work, how governments work generally, um, but I've been practicing law for 20 years, including in my own practice for the last 13, so that means that I've been operating a business myself. I have a degree in business because I'm interested in it. It's not the case that I'm anti-business by any means. I, uh, I'm pro-economic development. I'm just pro-careful, ecologically-minded economic development. I have been involved with the environmental movement for many years. I've been a member of the Green Party for the last 11 years. And I would say that in the history of the planet, and definitely in the history of Canada right now, we are really at a crossroads. And we are at a crossroads where we need to see some real leadership in ter terms of the environment. And I think that I'm the person to provide that leadership for the Yukon. Thank you, Lenore. Joseph Zelezny. So many years ago, I, I was uh, naive and, and thought, yeah, it's the end of the world again. And then I started looking into it and uh, learning more. And so I actually have a, a copy of a book here with me. Uh, it's called Climate Revolution. And it actually talks about all the different aspects that, uh, that affect our climate. And so I think the most important thing is to have an open mind to allow for free speech and not to... Uh, pander to United Nations campaign to give up Canadian sovereignty because that's what this is all about. If you look at the way the frameworks are written, uh, there's a desire to outsource all of this decision making, whether it's on immigration, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, industry or transportation. Uh, it's all to outsource to a, a supra governmental body that has no accountability and uh, is full of unelected officials with countless examples of, of corruption and uh, and we need to, uh, to shift that. We need to bring decision making back to Canadians, regardless of whether you might agree with me or not. Um, I will represent you, Connors. I love Canada. My parents escaped communism and came here for, for a better life, for freedom. They came here with nothing and, uh, and uh, have a decent life. And uh, that essentially, all the other parties are, uh, are totally on board with all the United Nations programs. Um, and. Uh, and so that's a, that's a decision, whether we put Canadians first and stop worrying about the rest of the world, lead by example and not be hypocrites, or if we're going to outsource uh, all the decision making to unaccountable people who honestly don't have our best intentions at heart. And so we need, uh, we need uh, this passion and uh, we need to ensure free speech is protected, something that all the other parties have voted, uh, they've voted in favor of censorship. And so we, we need the truth, uh, regardless of how uncomfortable it may be. We need to discuss all the different sides of, of a particular argument, regardless of what the issue is, because that's what the Canadian government is for, is to represent Canadians and do what's best for Canadians. Thank you, Joseph. Moving on to Jonas Smith. Uh, thank you. Um, I like to think that I have a well-rounded uh, life experience and, uh, and career. Uh, I am established in my career now, but that was not always the case. I, uh, I was a professional musician, which is another way of saying starving artist, and I, I, I say that term literally. Um, I mean, I'm not proud to say it, but I have been very poor in my life. I have been insecure in my housing. Uh, I was the guy who would wait and see wh where the party was when the, the lights came up at last call in the bar to see where I could sleep and wait until daylight when uh, my, my friend would go to work and I could jimmy the lock on the front door of his apartment building and sleep in the hallway till people started coming home at five o'clock. Um, I remember a time where I had less than $20 in the bank and I needed food, I needed kerosene, and I needed dog food. So I collected all my Canadian Tire money and uh, went back and forth between the grocery store and Canadian Tire to figure out who had a better price on the various products. So I could use my $18 through debit and my $15 in, in Canadian Tire money. Um, but, you know, that experience taught me a lot, as I refer to in my opening remarks, uh, living off-grid, uh, particularly under some s s severe financial uh, restraints. It taught me a lot about uh, luxury and necessity. Uh, and I went from that life to, in a very short period of time, being the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Premier of the Yukon, wearing a three-piece suit and tie and, tra and traveling the world representing Yukoners. 
I have walked the hallways of, of Parliament. I've walked the ha hallways of government buildings around the world. I have the experience. I, I've read cabinet submissions. I've written cabinet submissions. I know the process. And if you're looking for someone who can hit the ground running on October 22nd, I'm asking for your support. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jonas. Justin Lemfers. I love helping people. Fundamentally, I just love helping people. I have an intense dislike of injustice, and I like working with people to get the solutions that make sense for them. I've been working with Yukon government for about 16 years, and most of that time I've been a shop steward because I like working with people who need assistance. I've also worked with the Boys and Girls Club of Yukon. I'm a board member there. I started an LGBTQ2S plus community group to help families and people that needed assistance there. And none of that was for me. That was because there was a need in the community. There was people, there are people, that still need help. And so that's, that's what drives me, that love of helping people and working with people. And my pedigree, as you choose to judge it by my experience in government or education or the way I cut my teeth on politics in the union, that's for you to decide. But what makes me the best representative is what you see echoed of yourselves in me. And really, politics should be open. Politics should be open to everyone. Sitting up here as one of the five, there's a degree of privilege because not everyone has the access to resources to do this. Not everyone, there's a, there, let's be very clear, there is a poverty bar in politics. There's an accessibility bar, there's a representation bar. That's why diversity in politics is important. So if you see that in me, that's wonderful. What I also hope you see it in is yourselves because anyone should be able to do this. I hope I can be your representative and I hope that I can inspire you to also be engaged and be political and stand up for what you believe in and fight injustice and help people in need. Thank you, Justin. And finally, Larry Bagman. Uh, thank you. It's an interesting question. What makes me qualified to deal with this climate change crisis as your MP? Um, I think one of the basic things to, uh, to helps working on this is, uh, is scientific research. It's very important. We're an evidence-based government. The decisions should be made on evidence. Um, and so I'm a big supporter of that. And uh, evidence also includes traditional knowledge. So on the science side, I have a science degree. And on the traditional knowledge side, I think most of you know I have long-term relationships with the First Nations here. Of sat with them over many years, learned their stories, uh, where they're coming from and their traditional knowledge and, uh, and can tap into that. Um, ten years ago, I, the, uh, roughly ten years ago, I can't remember exactly, 10, 15, uh, they closed, the, they were going to close, stop funding the north, northernmost uh, climate uh, um, site for collecting data on the weather, myself and uh, Mark Garneau uh, fought strenuously against that in Parliament. Um, they also, they closed, there was a program under which all sorts of northern climate change uh, projects were funded across the country. Uh, the government uh, closed that, and I fought, unfortunately unfor unsuccessfully, um, to reinstate that particular uh, program for northern climate change uh, projects. As you also know, I was trying to educate uh, members of Parliament related to the uh, acidification of the oceans and uh, danger to us, this is over 10 years ago, uh, caused by climate change. And finally, I would say the, uh, the uh, northern parliamentarians of the eight Arctic nations, seven Arctic nations, uh, we have a committee of Arctic parliamentarians, and I'm the vice chair of that, I was elected vice chair of that. And I've, so I bring back, there's some great solutions in Scandinavia, for instance, I've brought that back and given in speeches in the Yukon two municipalities and in fact have emailed some of you some of the opportunities that they have in Scandinavia. Larry, thank you so much. <laughs> and our second question from the audience this evening. In order to meet the promised greenhouse gas emission targets in the Paris Accord, what will average Canadians have to compromise or give up in our material goods and freedoms that we take for granted in our lifestyles? And we'll uh, hand it over to Jonah Smith. Uh, thank you. 
I like to think that we don't have to give up much. I think that we have the opportunity here in Canada where we have such an abundance of wealth and an incredible quality of life that we can take that and harness that uh, luxury, that luxury and do more, not only for ourselves, but for people around the world. Um, again, we're well educated, uh, you know, com notwithstanding the challenges we have compared to what the rest of the world is facing, we are relatively uh, secure in our housing in where our food comes from. And so w we are a lot further away from the starting line than a lot of our contemporaries around the planet. So uh, I will uh, come back to some of the things that uh, I'm proud about with the Conservative Party platform about uh, exporting a Canadian clean brand. We have the ability to develop technology here. We have the brain power. We have uh, research and development capacity that we can come up with technology to share with a developing world that does not uh, have that ability. It is not a, in a position to, to make better choices. So for example, if we take carbon capture technology and can sell it to China, for example, and market it to uh, a coal-fired generation plant and reduce their emissions to the point uh, as there are in other areas where the, the, the vapor that comes out of the smokestack is actually cleaner than the surrounding air, then that is how Canadians can actually reduce global emissions on a large scale. And something like that works even here at home. For example, Northern Windows just across the way here, they market their product across the border in Alaska. And they know for every square inch of glass they produce what the GHG uh, emission reductions are. And so that is a way that even here at home, Yukoners can affect uh, the global uh, emissions. So I don't think we have to give any, anything up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas and Lenore Morris. I'm also going to agree that we should not actually have to give up that much. I think there will be a little convenience that will have to be given up. So for example, it is very convenient if you forgot to bring water to buy a plastic water bottle when you're out. And I'm in favor of banning plastic, disposable plastic water bottles. So um, I think that there's going to be some convenience factor. I think people will get used to bringing water bottles where they go out. So the same as most people have gotten used to bringing their own plastic bag, their own uh, reusable bags to the grocery store and things like that. Um, the Paris Accord commitments are about gr reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions come from burning fossil fuels. So all Canadians are going to have to first burn less fossil fuels and then eventually burn no fossil fuels. And what that means is that not that we're going to be giving up power. So p fossil fuels are burned for the purpose of creating power. So that can be power to run your vehicle and to run machinery. Um, in the Yukon, 62% of greenhouse gas emissions are as a result of transportation. So uh, there has to be a conversion of our transportation system to electric for Yukoners, especially Yukoners that have two vehicles. It means next time they replace one of them, they should re replace it with an electric one. But I'm going to say after 2030, our party's position is that there should be no new non-electrical vehicles sold in Canada. Canada. So, um, and that that means that we are still going to need power. Instead of getting that power from burning fossil fuels, we have to get it from renewable sources. So here in the Yukon, we are going to have to greatly expand the amount of power that we get from renewable sources to cre create electricity, to power those cars, to heat our homes, to do a lot of the things that we are currently doing with fossil fuels. <laughs> Thank you, Lenore. Larry Bagnall. Uh, well, one thing people have to give up is uh, the old types of appliances that have dangerous chemicals in it. As I said, they'll have to have Energy Guide by 2022 under us. Uh, cars, gas, uh, cars, uh, Volvo, as, and the car companies are on side. Volvo's not going to produce any more um, uh, gas cars. Uh, taxes, as people are going to have to not give up, but um, pay a fair share of taxes. As I said, one, our, one of our projects alone is $5 billion. That's like four times what the Yukon government gets for it to run everything in the world um, in its uh, operations. So $5 billion is a lot of money. It's a lot of taxes, uh, but it's essential to uh, to get us move forward on this uh, crisis. 
Uh, people have to get used to smart devices in their home. As I said, we're doing a pilot project with 500 homes in the Yukon. But it's just that the energy spread out over, over the day at your home uh, it comes at the right time and is saved at the right time. Um, there's suggestions that um, we're, we're going to put in legally binding targets. So uh, Canada's going to have to live up to that legislation. Uh, ev for every five years, there'll be targets. Um, there's suggestions that um, that the Yukon's like one tiny infinitesimal, infinitesimal part of of uh, the carbon production in the world, so we shouldn't bother about it. Well, you know, we talked earlier about can cancer chemicals, so just because we're not helping much of the world with our tiny bit of polluting cancer chemicals, should we stop banning them here? That's, uh, that argument doesn't make sense at all. Uh, and and uh, one of the things we might have to give up, depending on where you live, is your view of open spaces, because we're uh, promising to plant two billion trees uh, to sequester carbon. And finally, I'd say freedom. You mentioned freedom in the question. The freedom for to act yourself is good, but your freedom can't impinge on the uh, on the freedom of others, on the life of others, and the life of our planet. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> and we'll hand it over to you, Justin Lumpers. The NDP is committed to meeting the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Accord, uh, the targets that are set out in that panel. And there's going to be cost in getting there. Let's be realistic about it. There's going to be cost. But when we look at cost, we also have to consider privilege. Because not everyone has the privilege in society to meet those costs. We do have programs. We do have great ideas and initiatives in our plan, like electric vehicle rebates, moving from $5,000 to $15,000 later in our mandate. But the order, the, the only way that we can get there is for the people who have privilege to start paying the cost now. Because if we don't address that privilege cost, what happens is we leave people behind. We leave people who can't afford change behind. We have people in poverty right here in the Yukon right now. We know what our poverty rates are like. We know that there are people going to the food bank, people that we wouldn't even begin to expect that need those services and they're being left behind right now. So we need to make sure that we bring all those people with us. And that's why our plan is focused on making life more affordable. So yes, there will be cost for people, but we don't want to hit the people that don't have the privilege of paying that cost now. That's why we're investing in good jobs for people. That's why we're so focused on affordability. And that's why we want to shift the responsibility from Right now, with the application of the carbon tax, it's hitting everyone, and it's hitting a population of people unequally. Big corporations, the biggest offenders of all, those that are exempted under the current carbon tax system need to bear the responsibility because those corporations, as people, have the greatest privilege of all, and that needs to be fixed. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> and Joseph Zulazny. So the answer is none, because the People's Party of Canada would withdraw from the Paris Accord, because it's nothing but a socialist wealth redistribution scheme, which relies on controlling every aspect of your life. That's what the smart devices are for, so that you don't get the choice of when you want your, your heat turned on, so that it's completely outsourced to other companies who have been lobbying for all these changes. Uh, those corporations that have all those uh, exemptions are the ones that have been lobbying for this because then they're on the receiving end of subsidies or tax credits and this just results in a much larger and larger government controlling more and more of everybody's life um, while at the same time outsourcing all of these, uh, these technology or pollution issues to other countries where they exploit people. And so what needs to happen is ending all corporate subsidies and uh, calling out the the, the fraud that's been uh, perpetrated by s several scientists who've recently lost uh, court cases because they refused to turn over their data. This just happened in Vancouver at the Supreme Court. Uh, it was that famous hockey stick graph. So if, if there's no uh, transparency with this data, then, then what's the real agenda here? If one can only look at uh, Holland where there's literally thousands of farmers that have just been driving their tractors through this, through, throughout uh, the country protesting this eco-fascism. 
Germany has energy poverty. People are choosing between their meds or whether to heat their homes or, or if they're going to eat. Same thing. Uh, People's Party of Canada is the only party that will eliminate the carbon tax and not replace it with anything else and not worry about trying to deal with some hypothetical emissions from the rest of the world when tomorrow a volcano could erupt and, and totally uh, have more emissions than, than anything that uh, Canadians could possibly do. So we need a common sense approach. We need to reduce taxes that and allow people to have freedom because the more freedom you have, the better ideas you have, the more prosperity. And when you have prosperity, then you have more resources to come up with even better ways of doing things. You don't need to uh, force change if it's a good idea. Thank you, Joseph. And the third question from the audience tonight. Canada is way behind in reducing greenhouse gases and Yukoners and Canadians are wanting to see bold action when it comes to climate. The federal government has declared a climate emergency and then the next day announced the purchase of the Kinder Morgan pipeline. What would your party do going forward with the pipeline and the plan to build a new pipeline twinning it? And uh, we'll hand it over first off to Justin Lemfers. So I've already mentioned that we need to stop the investment in fossil fuel sub subsidies. That addresses the pipeline. We can't stand behind a pipeline that was purchased on the backs of Canadians in the face of the, the very hypocritical climate change announcement the next day. We need to make actions. We need to act with intention that actually benefits Canadian. So. Canadians. So when we're talking about investing in our energy future, it doesn't include pipelines. It includes an investment in wind, solar, hydro, and whatever clean zero emission technologies that we have going forward into the future. The future is not pipelines. Look at Trans Mountain. Look at the fact that there have been 86 spills of Trans Mountain since that pipeline was built. That's not acceptable. Look at Look at the, the terrible tragedy of, of what happens when we move away from pipelines and we start to move oil across our country by rail. And look at Lac Megantic. That cannot be allowed to happen again. We need to move away from fossil fuels. By cutting the subsidies, we will push Canada into a position where these new technologies can be invested in. And the investment will be expedited because we will also commit $3 billion to the establishment of a Canadian climate bank. Now that bank is focused on helping entrepreneurs, small businesses, First Nations and First Nation Dev Corps find opportunities to invest in the new energy future. The investment bank allows everyone to find an, a place in making the climate future that we have successful and less reliant removing that reliance on fossil fuels. Thank you, Justin. And Lenore Morris. Moira, would you mind repeating the actual yes, question? I absolutely. got the, no, the not, background. Not a problem at all. Uh, Canada is way behind in reducing, oh, the actual question. Yes, Here the we actual go. question. Blah, blah, blah. What would your party do going forward with the Kinder Morgan pipeline and the plan to build a new pipeline twinning it? Our party is opposed to the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. I think that's very well known. Um, Elizabeth May was arrested uh, protesting the pipeline last year. So we've been opposed to it for a very long time. The, the two big parties here in Canada, both the Conservatives and the Liberal Party, are in favor of more pipelines. Uh, the Green Party absolutely is not. Um, I'm just going to, I'm looking at a little chart here, and I just want to point out that between 2007 and 2017, there was a huge expansion of the oil industry in Canada. We went from producing 2.5 million barrels a day to producing 4.5 million barrels a day, which I think is a surprise to most people. I don't think most people realize that in the last 20 years that the oil, in oil industry production in Canada has approximately doubled. What's interesting about that 2007 to 2017 uh, number as well is that we've got this almost doubling of the oil industry production is that during that time period, the, uh, 
the employment in the oil industry actually fell. It fell by 8.1%. And it fell because during that time, there were actually two big drops in the oil price. And during on each of those occasions, the uh, oil industry laid off people and they didn't hire them back. So um, they're able to produce a lot mo more because they have been mechanizing and they have been automating jobs out of existence for a long time because that's what big corporations do. So we say that the further expansion of the oil industry, which is the only reason why we need another pipeline, a big pipeline expansion like Trans Mountain, is to further expand the oil industry that that's inconsistent with meeting our Paris Accord commitments. Thank you, Thank you Lenore. <laughs> Larry Bagnell. Um, thank you. Um, I <laughs> I've never um, um, promoted the pipeline, and I won't do that, but I'll just add some uh, facts for people to um, to add to the, the discussion. Uh, the uh, first of all, it, it's not increasing the amount of oil we produce because that oil could go to the United States through our pipelines there, or even worse, it's as you see the people interested are buying more and more rail cars, and and uh, most environmentalists don't think it should be going by rail. The emissions on the pipeline are included were included in our plan, our cap, our plan. And one of the benefits is it, it led to a cap on emissions, oil sands emissions for the first time in history. Um, so it, it fit within our plan to meet the 2030 targets. In fact, some of the new things I announced in my uh, list of things will actually uh, will reach our 2030 targets before 2030. Um, I listed probably at the beginning, you saw with this fine print, um, probably more comprehensive list of actions uh, of the, any of the, the parties. And so that is what's going to reduce our greenhouse gases while we transition. The $500 million or so uh, the pipeline makes in revenue, uh, whether the first, there's some First Nations who want to buy it, whoever owns it. Um, but right now, while the government owns it, it's going to go to this transition uh, to get us to uh, renewable energy as fast as we can. We're about three quarters of the way uh, for, for the actions that I mentioned we took in the first four years, three quarters of the way to our 2030 targets, and we have 11 years left uh, to get there. So, and as I said, we're, I think we're going to get there early. And we agree with uh, on eliminating the subsidies for fossil fuels. Um, eight of nine of the tax subsidies are gone, and the rest we're going to eliminate in the next few years. Thank you, Larry. And Jonas Smith. Uh, as I mentioned in one of my earlier uh, responses, uh, our modern Western lifestyle is is overly consumptive and wasteful. I mean, there's there's no doubt about that, and it's having an irreversible effect on on our our, our environment, or on biodiversity, on on wildlife habitat. I mean, anyone who questions the mortal realities of w climate change just needs to go next door and have a look at the woolly mammoth skeleton, right? But I'm going to say something that's not going to be popular in this room, and that is. I categorically disagree with the alarmist narrative when we talk about climate change. I think it diverts our attention and our efforts from the things that we can actually change. Um, I think we need to be weary of anyone that uses fear as a motivator. Uh, right now we've got uh, political parties using fear as a motivator, yet they offer the solution to alleviate that fear, and that solution is just hand over more of your money. Um, you know, and more than anything, I think it's absolutely, absolutely despicable that we are teaching our children to live in despair and fear. Uh, I think we should teach our children hope. Um, and when I hear people talk about the climate crisis and emergency, and I, I have to question, why do you live here in the Yukon where you have to heat your home 10 months of the year and every single necessity you consume is transported up here? You know, I believe in people, I, I believe in hope, and I believe that we can do better. Uh, so specific to the question about pipeline, I am unapologetic in my support for domestic energy production. I think the, the Canada needs more, or the world needs more Canadian oil. Um, and I think that will generate the wealth that we need in order to transition into the future. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Jonas. And finally, Joseph Zelezny. So Jonas made some good points, but at the same time, the Conservative Party had uh, uh, over a decade to get more pipelines built, and they didn't do so. Uh, same thing with the Liberals. This is nothing but uh, trying to buy votes. And one of the first actions that uh, Andrew Scheer did after 
um, uh, becoming a conservative party leader was force all his uh, MPs to vote in favor of the Paris Accord. And so the hypocrisy just never ends with the mainstream parties. You know, I'm not pretending anything. I say what I think, and if it's not popular, great. You can express your opinion. Absolutely, and let's have a discussion. But the, the alarmism and, and, and it, it, it's been going on for decades, right? And, and none of these end of the world predictions have come true. And really it's politicizing science. It's pitting people against each other in an attempt to just get more and more control. I mean, the, there's great, uh, great technology that's, that's being prevented from being used, right? Because of the, the level of corruption in government and the lobbying and, and uh, you know, uh, for example, if you, if, if you get, follow the money, then uh, there's been some sizable investments made into rail, uh, oil by rail infrastructure. And so those groups have been uh, funding uh, some of the, the initiatives to, to prevent pipelines because it would upset uh, their economic uh, decisions that they've made and their investments. And so really the, the number one thing for Canadians is, is honesty, integrity, n not this hypocrisy and, and cleaning up the corruption. It's just, it's, it's everywhere and it's doing everybody a disservice because we're squandering billions of dollars. There's no incentive to, to find efficiencies or better ways of doing things because somebody's uh, pocket wouldn't be padded. And so, um, and just to Lenore's point about uh, fewer jobs in the oil sands, that's because there's no new exploration. There's no new construction. That's why those jobs went away. Um, and it's going to result in much higher fuel prices because we haven't kept up with demand, which is growing around the world. Thank you, Joseph. Our fourth question of the evening from the audience, and may I just add, thank you all so much for writing better than a doctor. Um, the two First Nations final agreements provide for regional land use plans. The federal government is a signatory to the two treaties. If elected, and whether you form the government or not, will you advocate for expediting those plans by having more than one taken at a time? We will start with Joseph. Um, so I think there's uh, much higher priorities. Um, at the rate our economy is going, uh, things honestly aren't looking good. We've got an inverted yield curve and that uh, precedes a, a recession. Uh, yes, in, in dollar amounts, uh, things are definitely higher but that's because of record high debt levels at every level of government and cor corporations as well. It's absolutely unsustainable. And if it was you, you or I, uh, you know, we would have already been, been homeless and, uh, because our credit card would have been maxed out. And so this is actually doing a huge disservice to future generations because it's loading up this debt and it's sabotaging our domestic industry. In the meantime, we've got uh, uh, foreign companies that are swooping in, buying up, uh, resource claims for pennies on the dollar because of our distress, our domestic distressed uh, companies, and so we really need some common sense and and focus on doing things the best way possible. Absolutely, I'm a strong advocate for that. But at the same time, uh, we need to ensure that um, the the levels of funding and and government services can be maintained, and we can only do that if we kickstart our kickstart the economy, and we'll do that by cutting income taxes for everybody, simplifying it so that it's only zero, 15, or 25%, completely eliminating capital gains tax, completely eliminating carbon tax, cutting business and farm taxes from 15 to 10%. This will give more, uh, this will enable more prosperity and for people to, to figure out what they wanna do with their lives and for their, for their young ones. And, uh, you know, give back some freedom. There's been decades and decades of uh, less freedom, less rights, uh, more, con more government control of everything. And it's just, it's, it's gotten to a level where uh, there's been a lot of uh, Yukoners I've spoken to, and depending on how this election goes, they're looking at leaving Canada. It's just too expensive to live here, and, and it's, it, it's not reflective of Canadian values of, of fairness and uh, respect, uh, freedom, and uh, per personal responsibility. So just common sense. Thank you, Joseph. I said uh, two, but I think it's 11. Am I right, Skeeter? Are you Yes. Sorry, I'm, I apologize, you guys. So the 11, for, do, should I repeat the question? <laughs> the 11 First Nations final agreements provide for regional land use plans. The federal government is a signatory to the 11 treaties. If elected, and whether you form the government or not, will you advocate for expediting those plans by having more than one taken at a time? I apologize. And uh, Justin, we'll hand it over to you. 
Respecting the final agreements is critical, and when we're looking at the relationship, what we owe to Yukon First Nations, we have to make sure that we're giving them not only due respect, but also the ability to voice their concerns. So expediting is, is a dangerous word for me because what it means is that when we are going through any type of land use signing process, we may be giving power to lobbyists, lobbyists that are well-funded, well-heeled, and have a vested outcome. The only way that I would be willing to support the expedited uh, signing of a land use agreement is if the First Nations are fully on board with that solution. I would like, I would petition, I would work as a member of parliament to ensure that the First Nations have all the adequate supports in hand to do that. Because my fear is that they would be overwrought, overrun by the lobbyists, the industry groups that have the money to champion their special interests. So the answer is only if it works for those First Nations who are directly affected. Thank you, Justin. Lenore Morris. If all of the land use planning pro processes take as long as it took to come to uh, a determination of the of the Peel watershed, then uh, <laughs> we'll be in a lot of trouble if we don't expedite that process. Um, hopefully the lessons that were learned from that process will mean that the subsequent processes will be much faster and much simpler. There certainly are benefits to users of the land to have the land use management processes completed. I understand that. Um, I also understand that First Nations absolutely are such an essential part to that. And furthermore, that they have um, traditional territories that overlap. Like it's, it's inconceivable that they could possibly have to be dealing with more than one process at the same time. So I would say that although there's certainly some advantages to speeding up the process, not if it means that the process itself is not as fair and as efficient and as, uh, what's the word, <laughs> that, that it works, that it produces the right outcome. I mean, at the end of the day, the process is important, but the outcome is important too. So unless all of the parties were in agreement to, um, as I say, expedite and have potentially more than one land use planning process going on at the same time, I would be opposed to it. Thank you, Lenore. We'll move on to Larry Bagnell. Uh, thank you. Uh, just because it's in the uh, uh, final agreements and treaties, the modern treaties we have with 11 First Nations, doesn't mean we should disrespect the other three. It's, uh, it's a federal, it's a Canadian responsibility uh, to respect all Aboriginal peoples, whether or not they've chosen a uh, finished uh, final agreement, a self-government agreement. So they should all be included in any uh, land use planning exercises. Um, I definitely agree, as Lenora said, we'll be several generations if we continue at this rate. Um, and I think some of the First Nations are anxious to get the land use planning in their area done. You, c you know, when you don't have land use planning in place, there's no filter over what happens in a vast expanses of area and things just get established without a plan in place. When you have land use planning, it's, for, it's a great guide for developers, for parks, for everyone to know what you can't do in certain areas and you can go ahead. Um, as, as the other said, of course, just because you're, you're maybe funding, you know, one committee in this part of the Yukon, another committee in the other part of the Yukon, it shouldn't at all deter from, uh, from the quality of those land use plans or, and if any uh, First Nations don't think they have the resources uh, or the, uh, the number of people to participate, then of course they shouldn't, it should be an agreement. But the, it's in the hands of Yukoners. Uh, they have to rec do their recruitment for the boards. They have to do sufficient consultation so that all Yukoners get input into it. And, but to the extent that we, they want us as a federal government to provide more funds and help in any way we can, we certainly will. Thank you, Larry. And finally, Jonas Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, to the specific question of would I support expediting, my answer is no. I think expediting is absolutely the wrong approach. Uh, I'm sure the vast majority of people in this room tonight are uh, supportive of the final outcome of the appeal pl uh, planning process, uh, but you know, it was a pretty bumpy road to get there. 
Um, 20 years ago, one of the First Nations that uh, took the Yukon government all the way to the Supreme Court was actually a proponent of developing the iron ore deposit within the Peel and use the coal deposits to uh, build a railroad and, uh, and a smelter. So, you know, things change over time and, you know, that's life. Um, but these were meant to be land use uh, plans as opposed to protected area strategies. Um, and whether you like it or not, there is pre-existing land tenure out there, uh, which uh, people have invested an awful lot of money in. Um, and so let's look at the Peel process. Uh, the recommended plan said 55% permanent protection. Industry was told it's just a little bit more than half. That's pretty balanced. Uh, the 25% is interim. You know, we can have a look in, in, in 10 years and see where we're at. Um, we have since found out that that 25% interim protection will only change if all five orders of government agree to uh, open it up. And the final plan also included an additional 3% of protection, which the, and the 17% remaining land uh, not only is not very prospective, but access is, is uh, not uh, feasible. So you have essentially have 100% protection there. And yet uh, the proponents for expediting... Yeah, so fair enough, you're, 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 you're welcome to that opinion. But the uh, proponents for expediting the process uh, are asking industry and other stakeholders to uh, participate in future land use planning processes in good faith, yet the Yukon government has said that they're not willing to compensate for the millions and millions of dollars that these proponents have invested in these areas over the years. So absolutely not. I would not uh, propose expediting. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. All right. Uh, question number, I think we're on to question number five from the audience this evening. The climate crisis disproportionately impacts poorer and marginalized communities. Meanwhile, a handful of corporations get even wealthier by unfair tax loopholes and hiding wealth in offshore tax havens. To what extent do you see climate change and inequality as interconnected crises? And what policies do you personally support that would work to tackle both? And we'll start with Larry. Um, just on the... Uh First of all, poverty is a huge uh, part of our platform, and we've done a lot. I won't, I won't discuss it tonight because the different we did. I did it the po the poverty uh, forum, but um, it, the money that we've provided for low-income people, for low-income women, raised 800,000 people out of poverty. It's a very high priority for us, as is climate change. But the, we've set aside related to tax havens. Uh, we've set aside 300 million dollars uh, to, and it's resulted in catching some of those people trying to um, s escape to tax havens to um, those corporations that are acting illegally to escape their taxes. So it's been the biggest investment in history to do that, and we're continuing to do that. Um, the, a, a number of the transit projects that we're talking about um, are certainly going to help uh, low-income people. We've also, we're going to um, reduce the income tax uh, so right now you get approxi just uh, approximately $12,000 everyone gets, $12,000 off, except for before they start paying taxes. We're going to increase that to $15,000, uh, which will take about 78,000 seniors and um, youth out of poverty. The, uh, so a lot of the items that, um, that, uh, that might cost related to climate change we're providing uh, more uh, more funds for seniors, for youth, uh, for working poor, uh, so that they'll be able to afford anything. Uh, as I said, it's uh, we're all committed to um, making these things to save the earth, but there is some cost to them, and we want to make sure that doesn't disproportionately affect the poor. Thank you, Larry. We'll move on over to Jonas Smith. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I want to start talking about the carbon tax. I, I think it's ironic that uh, the most vocal supporters uh, of carbon tax as an as a initiative to reduce uh, emissions and fight climate change all agree that uh, the current model that's being proposed uh, won't work. It, it won't uh, change anyone's behavior. It won't uh, reduce our emissions. It won't uh, uh, meet international commitments. Um, and, and because the tax would have to be orders of magnitude higher than what it is right now. Um, and so we're talking about inequality, so how high do we want that t carbon tax want to go? Um, and, you know, 
it, in, on one hand, we're being told that the carbon tax is going to make us reconsider our, our purchasing options at, uh, at every, every opportunity. Uh, but on the other hand, we're told, oh, it's so low, you won't even notice it. But, you know, it, it can't work both ways. Um, you know, first of all, you know, we've got intentionally punitive measures limiting our, our, our decisions, which I don't agree with is government's role. And on the flip side, um, you're suggesting that uh, there, there, there are people in Canada that uh, even the slightest increase in, in price would have a significant uh, impact on their lifestyle. Um, and, but, in, you know, I hear people say, but the price of doing nothing is too high. But that's assuming the only thing to do is to raise the price of everything. And, and that's not true. We have lots of things we can do. Um, and, and so one of the things the Conservative Party is proposing is a very comprehensive suite of tax cuts. I, I referred to some of them earlier. But personal tax cuts, small business tax cuts, tax cuts for seniors, removing GST on uh, home heating, removing... Uh, income tax on maternity leave benefits. That's about $4,000 back in your pocket when you're trying to buy a crib and a car seat. These are the kinds of things that will reduce inequality and allow us to make the better decisions that we can make at a personal level to leave a better world to our children. Thank you. Thanks, Jonas. Joseph Zelezny. So it, it's funny because uh, a couple months ago, everybody was kind of ignoring the People's Party of Canada platform, and now everybody's trying to copy it, except they're doing it kind of... Uh, in a in a <laughs> like a fifty percent way, I was going to use a different word, but I'll be polite. Um, so basically, uh, what it shows is again hypocrisy. It also shows there's no uh, backbone, there's no spine to these parties because uh, they flip flop. They they change their answers to try and uh, please the greatest amount of, of, of voters. And they've been doing this for decades. Uh, conservative and liberal governments, back and forth, like a ping pong ball, every single time, uh, more debt, uh, higher cost of living, and uh, actually growing uh, uh, poverty. And so, if, if 100 years does, it, we, we still have poverty. So it's showing that their approach hasn't worked. And that's why the People's Party of Canada is the fastest growing political movement in Canadian history. And we have in one year, 315 out of 338 uh, candidates across the country. That's, that's unheard of. That's more in one year than the Green Party has done in 35 years. And so it shows that uh, there's, there's an appetite for, for change and, and to clean stuff up and, and make it fair for everybody. And so uh, apart from all the better tax cuts and ending all the wasteful spending and also ending uh, government choosing winners and losers, We'll also phase out supply management, which artificially uh, doubles the, the cost of uh, dairy and poultry products in Canada. And we also have interterritorial and interprovincial uh, trade barriers that don't make any sense because it's in some cases cheaper to, to get goods from, from China than it is uh, from Alberta or, or British Columbia. And so we, we need fairness across the board and, and we'll do this by eliminating all, all corporate welfare and all foreign spending and put Canadians first and, and make life easier and cheaper for Canadians and not try to micromanage you, them and buy their votes. We'll move on to Justin Lempers. A link between climate change and inequality. Who knew? Oh wait, that's us. So uh, I want to address a comment earlier about fear. And I want to make it clear that fear is irrelevant because it's science. Science is speaking. Science is my motivation. And what the scientists are saying is pay attention, not be afraid, pay attention. And there's a critical difference because if we act in fear, then we make poor choices. So we're paying attention. Our plan is paying attention to what people need. That's why the NDP commits to closing corporate tax loopholes. That's why we commit to cracking down on companies that are evading taxes. That's, because, that's why we want to make sure that our tax system is fair fair for everyone, not just for the big companies that have all the advantages, but for the people. I don't know how, actually I know exactly how many times as a student here in the Yukon, I was audited over taxes, three times, and that took five years to resolve. So we need to ensure that our tax system works for everybody, but more fundamentally, the inequality issue, we need to ensure that it's affordable for everybody. because affordability will be how people are moved to
be able to live in the new climate future. If you're already living in poverty and you can't afford to upgrade your home, then you have no resources to work with. So that's why our plan focuses on ending poverty, on making sure that people have guaranteed basic income, on making sure that people can afford their rent, their roofs, their food, their pharmacare, their childcare, their cell phone, their internet. We have a plan for it. It is our new deal for people because the way that we help people, the way that we address climate change is by doing both together. Thank you, Justin. And finally, Lenore Morris. Microphone, got it. <laughs> She's getting good. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm learning. Mm -hmm. So there's no question about it that the climate crisis, both within Canada, but more importantly, internationally, is uh, the effects of it are um, very, very disproportionate. And uh, um, we live close to the poles. We're not, uh, you know, we're above the 60th parallel. Most of the people in the world live pretty close to the equator, and they are going to be affected a lot more than uh, by climate change than we are in the sense that they are, uh, um, they're so crowded, they're not going to have places to move to, and that's going to be a serious problem that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, a lot of this, the other comments were about taxation, and I am going to talk about taxation here because we are already having the effects of climate change now, and mitigation of those effects is going to cost money, so that money does have to come from somewhere. The Green Party says that the burden of taxation is not fairly distributed now and that uh, uh, we would, we want to look at the whole taxation. We've got an incredibly complicated tax system. I studied tax when I was at law school and the Income Tax Act is about the size of what used to be a city of, of like a city of Vancouver phone book. It's just absolutely massive and uh, it's very, very complicated. It really needs to be streamlined. We. Uh, um, so we say that there should be establishing a federal tax commission to analyze the tax system for fairness and accessibility based on the pr principles of progressive taxation, meaning, yes, that people who uh, earn more money will pay a higher rate of taxation. The, there have been tax commissions before, but the last one was in the 1960s, so long overdue. Um, we would close tax loopholes for the wealthy. Um, my friend, Mr. Zlesny, mentioned capital gains tax. We actually would go the opposite direction on capital gains. Capital gains, the capital gains... <laughs> so good, so good. Thank you, Lenore. <laughs> this is what we call team players. I love it. Um, okay, it looks like we're probably going to have time for one more question this evening, so I will ask the final question from the audience tonight. Currently, there is a moratorium on fracking in the Yukon. Fracking has been found to pollute aquifers, cause earthquakes, and release methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, from outside of bore wellheads. Cut lines from fracking well sites are known to disrupt wildlife, particularly caribou. Eagle Plains is on the migration route of the porcupine caribou herd. It has been determined by the resource development community that oil and gas extraction can only be developed through fracking in Eagle Plains. If your party forms the next federal government, will you, as our MP, work to protect the moratorium on fracking in the Yukon? Joseph, we'll start with you. So I've actually heard uh, things contrary to that. There are other ways of... Um uh, being able to extract resources that are much more environmentally friendly and don't put at risk uh, uh, calving grounds or, or water supply. And so we need to come up with a common sense approach using the absolute best uh, methods and technology. Because uh, for example, uh, if done right, uh, the environment would be protected and people would have very uh, cheap <coughs> heating costs, for example, and we wouldn't be trucking fuel or barging it up from, uh, from Washington State. And so uh, this would also uh, enable uh, First Nations uh, to um, fund their, their self-governments and to be sustainable. And unfortunately, what's happened over the years uh, across Canada is that there's been this uh, established poverty trap where everybody talks about um, empowering First Nations uh, and self-governments or, or uh, their development corporations, but on the other hand, sabotages their efforts. 
There's even been uh, third party or uh, foreign funded uh, lobby groups pretending to be First Nations groups. They actually set up a corporation that had the name of a First Nations uh, band that actually did have a treaty with the federal government and, and essentially uh, sabotaged their efforts to provide jobs for their communities to enable their youth to, to thrive. And so, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword and, and we just need common sense and, and, uh, and enough of this, uh, this sort of saying one thing and, and doing another. Um, it's not fair to anybody and it perpetuates uh, dependence and it really only favors whoever is doing the, the lobbying or, or who uh, wants to profit f based on investments made uh, with uh, certain expectations that either things happen or don't happen. Um, and so that needs to stop and there's uh, treaties in place that need to be respected and not sabotage the economy. Thank you, Joseph. Jonas Smith. Um, so fracking is illegal for lack of a better term in the Yukon and it's absolutely not my place as Member of Parliament to, to tell the territory how to manage its lands and resources. That was part of devolution. Um, that said, I do want to make another couple statements. I fully support uh, protecting Anwar, uh, full stop period, uh, but I also fully support developing Eagle Plains. Um, I'm going to disagree with uh, whatever source you cited uh, that fracking is necessary to develop that resource. That is not at all consistent with what I have uh, been told. I have met with a proponent, Chance Oil and Gas, on a number of occasions, uh, many of whom their senior management team are uh, Vunta Kuchen citizens who have significant uh, personal interest in, in the project. I've spoken about this with the chief of the Vunta Kuchen. I've, uh, when I was in Old Crow not so long ago, a few weeks ago, I talked to citizens there. There is significant support for de developing that resource. Uh, I think that as long as we need oil and gas, uh, and we are going to need oil and gas for the foreseeable future. We should be developing it here at home, reduce the, the, the costs and emissions related with transportation. We have oversight here. We have the ability for First Nations citizens to prosper significantly, uh, and we can do it responsibly. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. Moving on to Lenore Morris. So the Green Party of Canada is simply opposed to fracking across Canada. So in the Yukon and across Canada for the reasons that were mentioned, it causes a huge amount of environmental problems which we say are not justified by the benefit. The, um, in general, we are opposed to the expansion of both the oil and the gas as well as the coal industry in Canada. And uh, although what's called natural gas, but used to be called methane, is, um, has been put out there as being a better alternative to oil and to coal. That is far, far less true if it's coming from fracking. Me methane is a very, very serious greenhouse gas, and part of the production process results in large amounts of it being released into the atmosphere. Lots of it's flared, meaning it's burned off. And the, um, furthermore, in the distribution process, lots of it ends up in the atmosphere. Methane is, uh, as a greenhouse gas, is eight times as powerful as is carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, one of the, I'm going to use my extra minute to um, <laughs> respond to one comment earlier. So there's this argument made all the time that we need the wealth from our fossil fuel industries to finance the transition. And I say that that argument's simply nonsense because as long as that wealth is in the hand of corporations and in particular, as long as Jason Kenney is the premier of Alberta, they are not going to use that wealth to finance the transition. Thank you, Lenore. Larry Bagnall, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. I agree totally with uh, Lenora on methane. It's way more dangerous than, uh, uh, than carbon dioxide, and so we don't want that released. In fact, we put in more restrictions on uh, that around leakage from uh, oil wells, uh, methane. So Anwar was also mentioned, as I think most of you know, I've had a lengthy battle to try and uh, preserve Anwar so, and the porcupine caribou herd. I've gone to Washington sometimes on my own expense um, and it's absolutely uh, had a passionate uh, time trying to do that, protect that um, against the Americans. 
uh, over many, many years and continue to do that. In fact, I've been, I did some of it even after the election started. Um, the, uh, on the fracking, the, uh, it's true, devil one of the things I'm proud of is devolution where we, we got uh, the residual, most of the residual provincial powers to the Yukon government, and that includes control of resources. Uh, so they make the decision on resources, uh, and they've put a moratorium on that. That being said, I will just give my personal opinion on fracking. I've, I did a lot of reading of some very thick documents to educate myself on that, and I am totally, totally opposed to fracking from what I've seen. And one of the reasons is that part of the process for fracking involves um, pumping carcinogenous chemicals into the ground. And uh, far be it for me to ever think that those are going to stay there forever. Um, they're going to come out somehow, and that's going to pollute our water supply or whatever. And what really upsets me is that th the companies don't even have to tell us what those uh, chemicals are because of proprietary rights. And I think that's absolutely ridiculous, and so I'm against fracking. Thank you, Larry. And finally, Justin Lemfers. I am anti-fracking, and the NDP does not support fracking. And let's talk about what fracking is, because we've heard other couple terms this evening. So when we hear the term geothermal, that's fracking. When we hear, well, we didn't hear this one, but it's in the Chance Oil and Gas Exploration Project. When we hear non-conventional drilling, that's fracking. So fracking is a dangerous activity because it actually destabilizes the ground beneath our feet. Not only does it put toxic chemicals in our water supply and our water tables, it actually causes earthquakes. And we've seen the science of that. And remember folks, believe science. So there have been earthquakes in BC and Alberta that have been directly attributed to fracking activities. So we need to ensure that we do not support fracking. So I, as member of parliament, would not support fracking or development of the Anwar grounds. And that also means working with our First Nation partners and those communities that are affected by those activities. So I was just up in Old Crow, and it's a small place. And I didn't meet a single person who is in favor of fracking. So I'm, I'm a little confused about that. But regardless of that, I would also point out that we need to look broader than ANWR because we need to look broader than just the board of the Yukon because ANWR is an international project and that's what a member of parliament really should be doing is focusing on how to protect those rights not only within the borders of Canada but also internationally working with our partner or if our partner is reluctant in the face of our partner to make sure that the values that the Gwich'in people hold dear are protected. Thank you Justin. Uh, that's going to wrap the questions for this evening. We have a little bit of time left. I, we may finish on time, everyone. We may. Ah. And it's all thanks to our wonderful candidates, who I am now going to allow two minutes each for closing remarks. And Larry, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you. I've, as I said, for 13 years, I've, it's been a battle. To I've been supporting uh, putting a price on pollution, and uh, so it's and been fought against for that and so it's very moving your support for a clean uh, a clean world a clean canada a clean yukon and what that would take um i just want to talk about one of our things i said i would talk a bit more about transit you know if you do a transit project um let's say the edmonton high speed line um you, you're saving million tons and tons and tons of, of carbon of greenhouse gases because people aren't driving their cars but we're doing it we've done an absolutely terrible job of saying the various things we've done so how many transit projects do you think we've done across the country 10 20 30 we've done over a thousand i just want to use the rest of my time to debate some of the items from the other people the alarmist the uh, people saying it's alarmist a vast majority of scientists uh, say that this climate change is real, so I, I don't, don't imagine how anyone can go against that. The item that Joseph said about your heat being turned on, controlling your life, there's an override for that. He, the, the fact that he said there's growing poverty, um, well, we've reduced poverty by 800,000 people. He said growing unemployment, we have the lowest unemployment in Canadian history ever since uh, uh, stats have been collected. In fact, uh, right now, um, 
the Yukon has been leading Canada, which is amazing. And uh, carbon tax, those that say it doesn't work, it's already proven to work in Quebec and BC and EU and California. And it, it will work here, obviously. No money overseas. You know, we've put lots of money into poverty, as I said earlier, but I saw our troops in Afghanistan, for instance, with people living on dirt floors one meal a day, uh, little if any fireweed, um, millions trapped in refugee camps. The two of the parties here want to reduce foreign aid or eliminate it. We're not going to give up on those people over abandon those people who can't even eat, so they can't think about climate change. So we're going to continue strong support of very, very poor people around the world. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> we'll move on to Joseph Zelezny. So again, the kind of hypocrisy speaks for itself. You know, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to have an open borders policy and to actually uh, uh, incentivize people to, to leave uh, along the logic of, of liberals to, to leave uh, low carbon emission lifestyles and, and countries to, to come to Canada and, and we are having uh, troubles uh, affording the, the systems we have here. And so we've actually got new people coming in who end up uh, homeless. We've got, uh, in some cases, 40% of, of uh, refugees or, or new immigrants coming in are, are homeless on the streets. Same thing with veterans who have been uh, treated terribly. Same thing with, uh, with the elderly. And so it's all smoke and mirrors. And really, the accountability of the federal government, it, it's, it's not being, uh, it, it's very disingenuous in how uh, you know, they provide over $600 million in, uh, in tax credits and subsidies to the media, specifically to spew their, their election platform over the last couple of months. And where, where, was all the, where were all these funding announcements when they were needed most? Why does everything always wait for an election period to try and buy votes? And then those promises are, are broken. We've got a prime minister who has multiple ethics violations. There's no trust in, in, in the establishment parties. It's been over 100 years of, of back and forth and uh, crazy debt, and, and people feel like there's no, uh, not much hope to, to be able to have a, a better career or to have more prosperity. And it's come at the expense of uh, a lot of money being wasted, and uh, and more and more attempts to micromanage how people uh, what they do with their lives and 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 with their earnings, and it's inherently unfair. So we need to stop the double standards, the hypocrisy, and just have a common sense government that puts Canadians first because that's the duty of a Canadian federal government. If people want to donate, that's their own prerogative. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, we'll move down to Lenore Morris. I'm going to take a slightly different approach and not talk about the environment, but talk about strategic voting. For me, as a Green Party candidate, strategic voting, that's been my real opponent in this campaign. Uh, so for everybody, there are two kinds of votes that you can make. You can make a sincere vote, meaning voting for the person in the party that you want elected, or you can make a strategic vote. Citizens will consider strategic voting anytime a country combines a first-past-the-post voting system, which is to say the kind that the Liberals promised four years ago to abolish, with more than two major parties, something that we've had in Canada for almost a century. In this election, in the Yukon, I wouldn't be running if I didn't think it was more important to possibly elect a Green than to risk further splitting the vote and electing Conservative. This has nothing to do with Jonah Smith. The ABC movement predates him for a very long time. Uh, I, my top is issue is the environment, and I've come to the sad conclusion that on environmental issues, the Liberals aren't that different from the Conservatives. In some ways they are, they certainly talk a better game, they don't do things that much different. The Liberals, after scorning the Conservatives' modest greenhouse gas emissions when they were in opposition, proceeded to adopt those same unambitious targets. Uh, they're pushing for the expansion of LNG in British Columbia. They're pushing for expansion of the oil industry in Alberta. They bought a pipeline for crying out loud. <laughs> They, <laughs> we will not change our government policies until we put different people into government. The Yukon is full of people for whom the environment is a top priority. All we need to elect, all we need to elect an environment is, environmentalist to government is to vote together. Thank you, Lenore. Jonas Smith, we'll move on to you. 
Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you to our organizers tonight. Thank you, Moira, for, uh, for moderating and keeping us on time and not making me bunker dance. Um, I've been campaigning for over a year now. Uh, I've been to every community in the Yukon at least once. Uh, I've knocked on thousands and thousands and thousands of doors. Um, and in that time, I've, I've missed a lot, of, a lot of time with my children, with my family. I've missed a lot of bedtime. I've uh, missed a lot of story time. Um, and I'm never going to get that time back. But I've worked this hard because I want to represent all Yukoners in Ottawa. And many of you here tonight in particular might not normally consider voting for me. You might not like my leader, you might not like my party, but I'm not asking you to vote for them. I'm asking you to vote for me. Uh, I walk the talk when it comes to conservation. I think I've, I've proven uh, to, to myself anyway over the course of my life. So I encourage you all to do it as well. And I'm asking for your support on October 21st. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. And finally, we've got Justin Limpers. We have been having this electoral experiment in Canada for the last many, many decades, and we keep expecting different outcomes. And we're always disappointed when we don't get something new and fresh. So I'm here to offer you something new and fresh. I'm here to offer you something that actually works for people. And when it's about, when we're talking this evening about the climate change and environment, and how it relates to people, then that's what we're offering. That's what the NDP does with our plan. We offer you a concrete plan that addresses all of those things together. And let's talk about water specifically for a moment and what our plan doesn't do. Because Elizabeth May has said that she thinks it's a good idea to put the management of First Nation water supplies into the hands of SNC-Lavalin. That's a company that's been charged with corruption activities. I don't think that's a good idea. And also, we know that on the climate change front, Elizabeth May has said that she is willing to prop up a conservative government to support the agenda that she sees fit for the country. What a dichotomy for a party that is so supportive of a climate change plan to be willing to prop up a government that denies climate change? I believe there's a better path. I know there's a better path. The NDP has that path. It's our plan, our new deal for people, our power to change. We have the solution. I, as your member of parliament, will work with you, for you, to ensure that we move into a climate future together. Thank you, Justin. We have all been a part of a big national event, over 115 debates across Canada, most of which took place tonight and all of them about the environment. The environment is a big issue in this election, and so we thank you all for being part of this movement. I'd like to thank all the candidates for taking the time. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for being here and for caring. And I'd like to thank CPAWS and the Yukon Conservation Society for bringing us all together tonight. I wish you all a wonderful evening and happy voting.